kind of redo a little bit on a search for an assassin and move on. So, Ms. McClure, can you tell me what happened immediately after the assassination concerning Memphis police? Okay, what were they doing that for? Okay, so they were looking for evidence. Now give me some examples of evidence that they found or assumptions that they made after doing their investigation around the Lorraine Hotel. Okay, the okay, in a boarding house across the street about 205 feet away. Um, they also uh, talked to a witness, didn't they, Cal? You remember what the witness told them? Um, what the witness, what she saw? They found a window jammed open in the bathroom, some footprints on the floor. They interviewed a witness in the vicinity. What'd she say? She, um, Schneid? She got rid of him. She oh. said that he got rid of him. Well, not yet. What'd she say first? Go ahead, Callie. You got it? Anybody? Saw a young white man fleeing from the boarding house shortly after 6 p.m. and they found out that the man had discarded a bulky package by a store doorway and sped off in what, Aaron? White Mustang. Emery, they found several things in that bulky package by the store doorway. Give me a couple. Okay, how about a couple more there? Uh, Allison? Between, except for two cans of beer and binoculars, what else did they find in that bulky package? Um, okay, how about one more? Um, tools, including a okay, Levi, give me another one. Um, portable radio. Okay, and Braden, what was the probably the big thing they found? Uh, Remington Game Master rifle. Good. And where was that rifle traced to? Uh, and under whose name, Mary? To a gun shop in Birmingham, Alabama, and then. Harvey Lohmeyer. Harvey Lohmeyer, who the gun was purchased by, according to that information. Well, the fingerprints on the rifle Hoyt clearly identified that it belonged to who? James Earl Ray. James Earl Ray. And I, one thing I mentioned, didn't mention yesterday, but we'll mention today, is that he had been in prison before. That's why they got his fingerprints. He actually was serving a 20-year sentence for burglary and such, and, and escaped after seven years, escaped from prison. And that he was an escaped convict when he shot... Dr. Martin Luther King, he had been escaped, and that's one of the reasons why he stayed in Iran, which we'll talk about. So after his escape from the boarding house, where did Ray go, Taylor Warner? He uh, drove to Florida. And what did he do there? He abandoned his car. He abandoned his car. Then what did he do, Mauricio? After, you know, after he went to Atlanta and abandoned his car, what did he do? He flew to Toronto, Canada. Right, and he stood there, period, stayed there a period of time, and finally, he arrives at Heathrow Airport in London, England on May 7th, 1968. And Carmen, then what does he do? He flies to Portugal and then flies back to London 10 days later. Right, and then what's he do when he gets back there, Aubrey? When he gets back to London after that 10-day hiatus in Portugal, what's he do? Well, he ran the room until June 8th. Right, and then what did he do, Sadria? He's recognizing the airport. Right, and so they arrest him, they charge him with having a fake passport and carrying a firearm without permit, and then they extradite him back to the United States where he was formally charged with the murder of Martin Luther King Jr. We mentioned that after he was assassinated, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover and Attorney General Ramsey Clark investigated the assassination, and they concluded that Ray had acted alone in the killing. Who was his attorney, Taylor Fulfer? Who, who, did Ray, who was Ray defended by? Percy Foreman. Percy Foreman. And according to Foreman, Ray pled guilty to the murder because Ray believed the evidence was so stacked up against him that he would be convicted and the, the penalty in Memphis was the death sentence by electrocution. Now that's kind of where we ended yesterday, was it not? Yeah. Well, one of the reasons that Ray didn't want to die and he didn't want to uh, be electrocuted is that he wanted to try to plea bargain out so he could get a long prison sentence. He had already broken out of jail once, and he thought it was in his best interest, obviously, rather than be killed by electrocution, to get a long sentence and take his chances to escape, because he had done it 
before. So after this plea agreement with the state, Ray was sentenced to 99 years in prison in Tennessee. He got a 99-year prison sentence. Got a 99-year prison sentence. So he sat and thought about that 99-year prison sentence for three days, and then he began to complain, saying he was innocent and that he was misled by Percy Foreman, and Percy Foreman pressured him into that guilty plea. So he spent three days in prison after being convicted and sentenced, and then began to complain that he was innocent, stating that his attorney, Percy Foreman, had misled him, giving bad advice, and pressured him into that guilty plea. So what would you do if you were Ray at this point? What would be your next course of action while you were sitting in the can for 99 years? What might you do if you were making that comment? What would you do? What's that? Okay, and to do that, who would have to do that for you? You probably wouldn't want the old attorney that misled you, so what does he do? He hires a new attorney by the name of J.B. Stoner. And what's Stoner going to do? He's going to try to get a new what? Trial. Okay? So Ray hires J.B. Stoner to represent him, and Stoner's job is try to get him a new trial, which he does try, but is denied. Okay? So Ray hires J.B. Stoner. J.B. Stoner tries his best to try to get James Earl Ray a new trial. He is denied a new trial. So for a period of time, years, following the assassination of Dr. King, things quieted down concerning the assassination. But, just like the Kennedy assassination, what began to kind of spring up? Controversy and conspiracy theories, okay? It always happens. So, things do quiet down for a period of years following the assassination of Dr. King. But however, as the Kennedy assassination, controversy began to spring up across the United States. Now this is kind of interesting. Because of this controversy that sprang up across the United States concerning the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., they formed another House Assassinations Committee okay, to reinvestigate his assassination. And ironically, it was formed the same year as the House Assassinations Committee was, that was formed to do what? Investigate what? The Kennedy assassination. So they had two going at the same time. One was set up in 1976 to investigate Kennedy's assassination. The other one in 1976 to reinvestigate King's. Now, the only difference is the House Assassinations Committee that did Kennedy's assassination was formed in 76 and started in 76. This one, the hearings didn't begin until 1978. So there were two years. They were formed the same year. You see what I'm saying? Both House Assassination Committees were formed in 1976. And the one that was investigating Kennedy investigated Kennedy. And in 1978, they began to investigate King. The difference between the Kennedy investigation and the King investigation is Lee Harvey Oswald didn't testify at that one, did he? But James Earl Ray did testify at this one. Okay, so the hearings began in 1978, and James Earl Ray testified himself. So you want to hear his story now? This is his story of what happened here. It's kind of interesting. So this is what he testified to. He said, remember I told you he had been serving 20-year sentence for robbery in the state of Missouri, and he escaped after seven years? He said that after he escaped from prison in 1967 that he fled to Canada. This is what he told the House Assassination Committee, that he escaped from prison in 1967. He was serving a 20-year sentence for robbery, burglary. He served seven years and then escaped. And the year that he escaped was 1967, and he claimed that he went to Canada after he escaped. He stated that in Canada he met a man with a Spanish accent who used the alias Raul, which is on your ID sheet. 
So Ray tells the House Assassinations Committee that he goes to Canada in 1967 and he meets a man of Spanish descent with a Spanish accent who only called himself Raul. This is what Ray tells the committee. That he goes to Canada and he meets a man of Spanish descent and accent by the name of Raul. He further goes on to tell the committee that he went to work for Raul. And his job was to bring contraband into the United States from Mexico. What is contraband that he might be bringing? What are the two biggest contraband items? Drugs and weapons. Okay, guns in this case. So he claims to the House Assassination Committee that he went to work for this Raul and he was basically uh, bringing contraband into the United States from Mexico in the form of drugs and guns. This is a story he's telling the committee. He continues to testify that Raul told him to buy a rifle for him and to secure a room in Memphis, Tennessee for a few days in April of 1968. He said, Raul informed me to buy a rifle for him, and then I was supposed to go secure a room in Memphis in April of 1968. So Ray testifies to the House Assassination Committee that this Raul, who he went to work for, bringing contraband into the United States from Mexico, asked him to order a rifle for him, and also asked him to go secure a room, and Ray stay in that room for a few days in April of 1968. According to Ray, he was supposed to deliver the rifle to Raul the day before King was shot. According to Ray, he was going to deliver the rifle to Raul the day before Dr. King was shot. And then what's the next thing he says? What? Somebody said it. What's that? Well, kind of. He said, so what is he going to say? What's he going to tell? Yeah, he, yeah. What? He says... Well, yeah, I, uh, you know, I delivered the rifle to Raul and <coughs> departed. Never seen him since. That's the story he gets. Yeah, I did that. Ray stated he made the delivery of the rifle to Raul, departed from the delivery, and never saw Raul or the rifle ever again. That's what he testified. Well, when they ask him, well, where were you then when King was assassinated? He said he was at a Memphis garage getting a tire fixed. He said he was at a Memphis garage getting a tire fixed when asked, well, where were you at the moment that Dr. King was shot? He said he was at a Memphis garage getting a tire fixed. And so what would be the next question they would ask him? Well, well, if you were in a garage getting your tire fixed, why have we been chasing you all over the... Europe, you know what I mean? You know, why did you run? What was the excuse he gave for that? Yeah, I'm an escaped convict. And I was afraid when I heard the police sirens I would be picked up and sent back to prison. So he claims he's getting a tire fixed in a garage during the time of the assassination. And when they ask him why he ran, he said, well, I'm an escaped convict and I thought, sure, I was going to get caught and sent back to prison. Okay, that's what he told me. Well, when they concluded, do you think they believed anything he said? No, they did not. So the Congressional Committee did not believe Ray. They concluded in their findings that this Raul never existed. And he was sentenced back to prison. Or he died on April 23rd, 1998. So he was sentenced back to prison served the rest of his life in there until April 23rd, 1998, when he died. And all the time that he was in prison after the House Assassinations Committee decision, he claimed his innocence. He even met with Martin Luther King's children and visited with them, stating that he was not guilty of the crime of murdering their father, to the point where the children believed him in the end, before he died. So... I don't personally think there's any evidence that's contrary to the fact that Martin Luther King 
was killed by James Earl Ray, but there's always got to be a controversy, and there'll be a controversy in the Robert Kennedy assassination as well. There's always got to be a conspiracy. Okay, we'll give you a little break for the rest of this period, and we're going to watch a video on the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Okay? Okay, please keep in mind the recorder is still going. Hey, listen, just right, the bell may ring, the first bell may ring about a minute or so before this finishes. I would like you to stay here and listen to the end of it. I think it's going to go about a minute over because it's 30 minutes, so stay put, it won't kill you. Lights, please, someone. See if there's anything in here I didn't tell you. The civil rights movement is standing on a motel balcony when a shot rings out. The target, a man trying to make peaceful progress, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It sets off a firestorm of violence and protest that still echoes today. This is the minute-by-minute -minute account of the assassination of Martin Luther King. in Memphis and checks into the Lorraine Motel. He's come to lend his support to a group of black city sanitation workers. King has been fighting for them since February when they went on strike demanding better pay and working conditions. That evening, King marches side by side with the workers in a peaceful march and then heads for the Masonic Temple where he gives a powerful yet strangely prophetic speech. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. It's the last speech, Dr. King will ever make. The son of a preacher, Martin Luther King Jr. was born in Atlanta, Georgia in 1929. By the time he's 26, King is himself a preacher, working at a Baptist church in Montgomery, Alabama, when a small act of defiance launches a national movement. On December 1st, 1965, Rosa Parks, a 42-year-old black seamstress, refuses to give up her bus seat to a white man on a Montgomery bus. Under the local laws of segregation, Parks is arrested, charged, and fined $14. Outrage erupts, not only in Montgomery, but all across the country. Martin Luther King is president of the Montgomery Improvement Association, and he leads its black citizens in a bus boycott that lasts 13 months. Until December 13, 1956, when the U.S. Supreme Court rules that Alabama state and local policy on segregation is unlawful. It's a great victory for King. Seven days later, he takes a ride on a bus, sitting at the front in seats previously reserved for whites only. The boycott pushes King into the national spotlight. A firm believer in nonviolent protest,
King spearheads the growing civil rights movement under the umbrella of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. He crosses the country leading marches, making hundreds of inspirational speeches, and motivating the protest movement. But while the African-American community regards Martin Luther King as a hero, there are others who see him as a dangerous threat. In 1961, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover is convinced that the civil rights movement is being infiltrated by communists. He gives orders to tap King's phones and keep close tabs on him wherever he goes. The surveillance continues for the next six years. This doesn't stop King's growing influence and his massive impact on society. August 28, 1963. King directs a march in Washington, D.C. And the news coverage is seen not only in America, but across the world. Despite President John F. Kennedy's earlier opposition to the march, the crowd of 250,000 people walk on without incident. That evening, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, King delivers one of the most memorable and electrifying speeches in history. I have a dream that one day Sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream. My four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. I have a dream. King's soaring rhetoric demands